the book of Ezra. I heard, and I, I, I hadn't heard this before, but I heard today there's been a big, um, a big push in some Christian circles. Uh, I, I guess you call them Christian. I, I heard a, a debate uh, about it uh, this afternoon and, uh, on polygamy in the Christian church. Like that was the person claimed to be a Christian and was arguing from the Bible that that was acceptable. Now, obviously, when I say he was arguing from the Bible, he wasn't using the Bible, but he was making claim, claims and statements, and apparently that's becoming a bigger thing. And uh, I, I just, friend, I, I listened to that today, and I thought, we're cooked. <laughs> we are done. My goodness. Oh, my word. We twist the Bible and corrupt the Bible. That is why, listen, friend, all of us can be guilty of twisting the Bible a little bit if we're not careful. We've got to read the Bible in context, read what God is saying, who he's saying it to, or you're going to be like some of these knuckleheads who are twisting and perverting the Bible for their own lust. And it just, man, it, it drove me nuts today. I, I listened to about the, the debate between the two people. I listened for the first uh, six minutes, and I had enough. I couldn't take it anymore. Um, absolutely butchering Scripture, and uh, it's just, man, we need a revival in America. But even more than that, we need a revival in the church. Uh, we need a revival among Christians. Ezra chapter 5, and that's why I think I pushed this uh, kind of hard. We need to know the books of the Bible, and uh, if God permits me to, to stay here, and um, that's God's goal, I want to go through every book of the Bible uh, at one point or another. Some of you are already getting nervous about Ezekiel. <laughs> me too. <laughs> but we'll have a good time at some point with that. Ezra chapter 5, um, we're going to see discouragement. You remember in chapter 4, Israel, uh, they were taken captive by Babylon uh, and Assyria, the northern kingdom. And uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. The walls were destroyed. Um, the, the temple was destroyed, the place of worship. And then we see God stirred up a pagan king's heart and pointed his people to come back under certain leadership. Excuse me, the book is divided into two halves. Uh, after chapter 6, we're going to find Ezra. The first half... We don't see Ezra. We see a couple other gentlemen who are kind of leading the charge to build the temple. You remember when they got back, they started to build and things were going well. And they start to build. But do you remember the first thing that they built? Of course, right when they got there, they built some uh, just places to stay, just really brief places to stay, some type of housing, some type of structure. And then, uh, bro, uh, you, you said it, it, they started with the altar. Because in order to restore the worship back to God, they had to deal with the sin that had been neglected for all these years while they were in captivity. And it's a good point to remember. In order to restore our worship, maybe when we've gone astray or maybe when we've not worshiped like we should, we always have to start with sin. Sin hinders our worship. So we have to deal with sin, confess sin, forsake sin, uh, get away from sin, stop, uh, stop justifying sin. We have to deal with the altar. And then they start to build and some people are like, man, this isn't the way it used to look. It's not as nice as it was. So there was some rejoicing and there was some weeping. The community around Jerusalem heard that and they came wanting to figure out what was going on. You remember in chapter 4, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin in verse 1 of chapter 4, they come over and what do they want to do? Hey, can we help you? We'll work together. And uh, Zerubbabel and uh, Jeshua and these guys who were leading it, they understood that these men were carnal, wicked men who wanted to use the worship maybe for one of two things. They wanted to twist and corrupt the worship or they wanted to use it for their own benefit. They were very wicked, carnal people. They came in. This would have been the group that in Jesus' day would be known as, some of them would be, known as the Samaritans just up north. Uh, they had uh, brought in their religion and they tied it with Judaism and they were trying to mix it all. Friend, when you worship God, there's no mixing other stuff with it. Worshiping God is done a certain way. It's done, a, a, God has a plan for that, and this was not the way. So you remember last week we saw the problems that came in. And friend, you and I are going to have problems, right? 
We're going to have struggles. Tonight we're going to talk about this word discouragement. Okay? We're going to look at a time of refreshment. Not refreshments. I know some of you are getting excited. We're not doing that after church tonight. But during discouragement, we need a time of refreshment. And how will that look? Someone name somebody in the Bible who is discouraged. Name somebody in the Bible who is discouraged. Jeremiah. Yes. David. Somebody else. Jonah was discouraged. Yeah. Who said that? Elijah? Yeah, that's the one I was thinking. Whoever said that? Yes. Good. There's discouragement throughout the Bible, right? There are several people. We can list a lot of them. Probably every one of the great prophets that we know of had moments of discouragement. And friend, you and I will. Anyone who turns to Christ, surrenders their life to Christ... The devil and his agenda and the world system is not going to leave them alone. You ever find somebody, you go out and you ask them, you invite them to church to hear the gospel, and, uh, you know, you call them maybe Saturday night and say, hey, you still coming? Yeah, I'm still coming. And then on Sunday morning, you, you, you're texting them or they text you and say something came up. There's always something that comes up. When somebody surrenders to God and they start to serve God, what happens? Problems still come. People who get saved, they get baptized, they get invested in the local church, and they get busy. Problems come, and discouragement comes. We're going to face, not necessarily in the same way, but we're going to face the same idea. Look at chapter 4, verse 24 tonight as we jump in. Man, I just started this whole thing really good, huh? We're talking about discouragement. We're naming people discouraged. Oh, it's going to get good. Just stay with me. Look at verse 24. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia, or Darius, depending on which scholar you read. We're going to see a time where the work of God is stopped for depending on who you, who, it's about 16 to 18 years. Why did God call these men and call these people, about 50,000 of them, to leave their, their homes in Babylon to come back to Jerusalem? What was the purpose? To reestablish worship, to build the temple, to eventually build the walls. So God's plan, God's agenda, and God's will was not getting done for about 16 to 18 years. Now we jump to a couple kings later, back in Babylon. We pick up in chapter 5 and verse 1. We need a time of refreshment, and what will that look like? Look at verse 1. Then the prophets Haggai, the prophet Zechariah, the son of Ido. Anyone know anybody? Ido? Ido? I do, I do. I don't know. However you want to say it. They prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, even unto them. So now we have to stop for a minute. We have to find out what the Bible, what the prophets are going to tell these individuals. So in this situation, instead of seeking uh, for the first moment, they could re begin to rebuild and fulfill God's purpose for them. Listen, they became comfortable outside the will of God. So the king back in Babylon, the enemies of Israel, they heard them get excited about the temple. They came over. They started to stir up trouble. They started to stir up problems. They wrote a letter back to Babylon saying, hey, look, if they rebuild the walls, you know what these people are known for? They don't pay taxes. They are rebels. And if you remember, that's what they were. They caused up trouble. So now the king writes back and says, all right, that's it. No more. You guys can't build anymore. So instead of just stopping for a time, they just decide to completely give up on God's plan and God's will. It was a brief interruption, but they made it turn into the rest of their life. We're just going to do whatever we want. And there's discouragement. And uh, there should have been a little shame. Now, during the, the, the reign of Cyrus, we have something new that happens. Okay? Pick up in verse, uh, go to Haggai. Haggai. We're going to see what, what God tells them from his word. It's, it's, it's a discouraging time for these people. God had called them to a certain work, and they were 
not interested at the time. So, um, it's interesting to put the Bible all together. Ezra is way back in, in chronological order. It's way back here, the Malachi's here, but technically they're at the same time. It's somewhere during this time that the book of Esther takes place, and uh, we're not going to get to all that tonight. But look here in Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be what? So because of the criticism and the slander, because of the threats, because of unmet expectation, listen friend, because of the prayers that they had prayed that they felt that God had not heard, because of the fear that they had, because of maybe they even claimed scripture from the Old Testament and it just seemed like none of this worked, they were discouraged. Let me ask you, just, just uh, you and God, think about this for a moment. Have you ever been discouraged when you've been slandered or criticized? Have you ever been discouraged when you've had threats? Have you ever been discouraged when you have unmet expectations? Uh, let me ask you one that might hit home. Have you ever been discouraged when you've prayed prayers and they haven't been answered? That's what these individuals were going through. They just left Babylon. They had walked approximately a three to four months through the wilderness. They came here to do the will of God. God had purpose for them. And now the enemies around them said, yeah, right, you're not going to do that. We're going to even turn it into the religious people. We're going to turn it into the political people. You're not going to do this. And so fear, unmet expectations, prayer, they were like, man, God, you promised in your word that this was going to happen. God, you said it, and it's not working out the way we wanted to. They're discouraged. J just being real tonight, there are times you and I get discouraged. And maybe it's not one of these things I name. Maybe there's something else that you're struggling with. And you need some spiritual refreshment tonight. Let me just give you a couple things about that. As people try, Stephen Cole wrote it this way, people try to deal with their spiritual discouragement in many wrong ways. Many plunge themselves into other things that they think will bring fulfillment. Entertainment, sports, travel, careers. Tragically, some turn to drugs or alcohol or adultery. All these things only dig them deeper in discouragement. And I, I even know some who went so deep and the discouragement was so heavy and hard that they would commit suicide. Discouragement's a real thing. And it's popping up in the church. And it's causing some very serious problems. Due to the fear, due to the threats, due to the fact that it didn't seem like God was keeping his end of the bargain. There was discouragement. And it's a very real thing. So how is that handled? Well, we need a time of refreshment. So number one, as we look at Haggai, we see in chapter 1 and verse 2, we see that Haggai comes and he starts to say, listen, listen up to what's really happening here. This people say... In other words, God had said something else, but this people twisted it and made it something to their liking. This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. I want you to write this down tonight. Number one, if you are discouraged, you need a time of refreshment. You need to res refresh yourself with his word, with his revealed word. Friend, there's no escaping it. We need to be encouraged and it must come from God's word. It must come from God's word. What was, in, in our story here, what was Satan's desire regarding the temple? That it not be built. What was God's desire regarding the temple? Build it up. He was very clear. He said, build it back. We need to get this done. This is very serious. Make Jerusalem great again. No, no. Um, they, this, is, uh, this was Satan's desires against the will of God, and it was a clash. And who was winning? The discouraged group. Man, 
It's just it, because of these great obstacles against the work, God's people started to do something we all do. We begin to rationalize. Rationalize. Well, it's really not that bad. I mean, after all, we left our homes in Babylon. We left what we had. We left our family. We left our friends. We've sacrificed so much. We came across the wilderness. We've, we've, we almost, you know, th bad things could have happened along the way. Man, we could have had all this going. We get here. We do your work. You know, the king said we can't do it. So now we're just going to live out our days in happy bliss. No, that was Satan's agenda and Satan's will. God's agenda and God's will was to build the temple, then build the walls. So God sends his word and he tells them, hey, hey, you guys, we got a problem here. There's something that's missing. So he, he confronts them. They have a wrong perspective on God's timetable. So when you refresh yourself with God's word, you're going to start to get a different perspective on God's timetable. Look at what he says in verse 2. This people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Friend, you and I rationalize ourselves like crazy. We rationalize the things that we do, even though God's word's really clear about many things. And we still rationalize against it. They had a wrong perspective on God's timetable. Also look down at verse 4 here very quickly. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lie waste, talking about the temple. God's house, the place where God wanted to meet with his people. The place that had been vacant for 70 years. Now it's been vacant for another 16 Man, you guys are out living it up, living in your houses. You put all your effort into your house, but not my place. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, what? Consider your ways in verse 5. So we see not only was it Satan's desire versus the will of God, not only do we see a wrong perspective on God's timetable, but we also see misplaced priorities. The problem was simply wrongly or misplaced Priorities, wrongly ordered priorities. Friends, you and I better check on what is most important to us. My wife and I, every once in a while, will do a checkup and see what we're investing most of our time and what we're putting most of our effort into. And we sometimes have to look and say, there's a few things we need to change up here. Our priorities are not in the things of God. Our priorities are on things that don't matter. And every once in a while, we have to look into that just a little bit. We all have to be very careful. Also see, look down at verse 8, if you would. So the, God tells them, consider your ways again in verse 7. Then he says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be what? Okay, stop for a minute. Because for this last 16 years, these individuals have been building their house and putting all their effort into that. And God's work done God's way is going to require some effort. Hey, guys, I want you to get a group, and I want you to go to the mountain. I want you to start getting supplies. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. I want you to get back and get busy with what I had put in place. We also see here in verse 8, there's a lack of focus. God calls them to work. The people, listen, I, I love what uh, Guzik said about this. The people had allowed a delay that was beyond their control to become a delay of their own choosing. By the way, I, I was going to put up the timeline, but there were a couple different um, kings in Babylon during this time, and they would have known it. So the, 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 the king that had told them to stop working, there were others there. They just made this delay turn into, well, now God's not going to do it, so we're just not going to do anything. Sometimes God slows us down, something comes in our way, and it puts a delay and we just live in that delay the rest of our life. God gave us clear command. God gave us purpose. God gave us this or that. And a delay pops up and we just say, all right, we're done. We tried. That's what they've done here. But when you refresh yourself with the word of God, you're going to desire God's will. You're going to put uh, the perspective, the right perspective on God's timetable. You're no longer going to have the wrong priorities. And you're no longer going to have a lack of focus. You're going to be busy serving the Lord. Go to Zechariah, if you would, just a page over. Zechariah chapter 1. So Haggai, he just kind of rips into him. Zechariah kind of... 
he kind of is a little nicer about it. But they both write to him. Uh, Zechariah comes with more of a, um, like a personalized letter a little bit more. Haggai just rips into him. He's like, you guys have done nothing. You're, using, you're staying in your home. You're neglect, neglecting God's will in God's house. Man, you're, <laughs> consider your ways. What are you doing? Zechariah makes it a little more personal. We don't have time to read all of this tonight. But look at verse 2. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. So he's reminding them about what has happened in the past. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me. So if God is saying to turn unto him, what does that imply? That you've turned away. You understand, Christian, I think sometimes we get discouraged and we turn away from God. We get focused on this other stuff instead of focused. Our highest priority is on God and his way and his will. Even though we don't do it on purpose and we don't mean to, we got to turn around and get a better glimpse of God. Our discouragement sometimes, whatever it is that's in our life that's discouraging us, that takes over. And guess what? When that takes over, it means you took your eyes off of God. Right? A couple of you at least think so. Okay, maybe we'll skip that point next time. Refreshing ourselves with the word of God. So he tells them in verse 3, Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto... Man, God's hand of favor and blessing had turned away from these people. He just brought them out to Babylon. The Bible doesn't describe it, but God's saying, You look back to me. Hey, I'll make sure everything's taken care of. Look at verse 4. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. And guess what happened to the fathers? God brought judgment with the Assyrian army and then with the Babylonian army. So what's a lesson we can learn from this? God will judge his own. The word we would use is chasten. So when people get and they're not refreshed with the word of God, they're just living in the discouragement, and that a little delay turns into a lifestyle, and then all of a sudden God's saying, hey, I want your attention back on me, and you neglect it and you ignore it. Do you think God's just going to say, oh, that's okay, we'll get you next time. <laughs> that's okay, we'll take care of it later. No, no, God will judge. And that's what Zechariah is trying to bring this personal touch. Hey, guys, let me tell you a story. You remember what your fathers did? They neglected me. They didn't turn to me. They didn't listen to me. They didn't pay attention to me. And that's why I took my hand of protection off of Jerusalem. Even though I promised they'd come back, I allowed Babylon to come in. Because God had already stopped the Assyrian army with Hezekiah. So good, could God have protected them? Yes. But God said, I'm going to use them to bring chastening. And that's the same with you and I today. Sometimes discouragement becomes so big. We need a time of refreshment. Number one, we need to refresh ourselves with his word. Number two, go back to uh, the book of Ezra very quickly tonight. Book of Ezra, chapter 5. So something happens in verse 2. Once they're confronted by these prophets, they do what even discouraged people should do. They get busy with the will of God. So what do they do in verse 2? They begin to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. So number one, we refresh ourselves with his word, but we also see here, number two, we refresh ourselves by getting back to work, getting back busy again for him. There's something about serving and being busy for him, getting back to the working, the things of the Lord. God's word has led them, and now they follow it. God's word has convicted them. It's encouraged them. And now they say we're going to step out in faith, and we're going to do what we should have done all along. We're going to get busy again for him. Number three, quickly tonight. Refreshment may come. But it will require perseverance. So they're discouraged people. They needed refreshment. Where does refreshment come from? Almighty God. How does God speak to us? His living word. This book is alive. 
This book is not dead. It's just not some words. This will be in heaven. God's words are in heaven. This is a living book. So how do we refresh ourselves from discouragement? The word. Once we have refreshed ourselves with his word, then we refresh ourselves by getting back busy again for him, finding a way to serve him. And then we see the third point here tonight, refreshment may come, but it's going to require perseverance. Because have you ever noticed when you've been discouraged and frustrated and then you get excited for the things of God again, after that you get tempted to be discouraged again? Anyone ever notice that? Because it's not like the, the, the enemy, which is the world, the flesh, and the devil for us today, according to 1 John, it's not like the enemy is going to stop. No. We take a couple steps forward. Man, we're tempted to be discouraged. We're tempted to quit. We're tempted to be done. And then we go back to the Word, and the Word refreshes us, and then we're back busy again. And then we go a little farther. Refreshment will require perseverance. Require perseverance. Look down at verse 3, if you would. Now they're excited again. Now they're busy again. It's been 16 years. There's been no progress. And now they're back working again. Look at verse 3. We'll have to conclude with uh, the, these few verses tonight. At the same time came to them Tatnai. Tatnai. I don't know if you can say it better. I'll power to you. I'm not pronouncing the next one, though. Governor on this side the river. So there was an individual here on behalf of Babylon who is kind of responsible for this area. He was not part of the group, I don't believe, uh, that I can find. He was not part of the group that shut them down 16 years before. But he comes on the scene, and look at what he does at the end of verse 3. Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Then said we unto them, after this manner, what are the names of the men that make this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to cease, till the matter came to Darius." or Darius, and then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. What stopped them before? The letter that was sent to the king. What could stop them now? Another letter is going to be sent, and that's what the rest of this chapter is about. Verse 6 down through verse 17. Refreshment may come, but it's going to require perseverance. They are questioned, but not stopped. See, when they got busy and started again, they were questioned about what they were doing, but they weren't told to stop yet. And as a matter of fact, at the end of this chapter, they're going to, when they send this letter, it's going to get to the king, and the king's going to read it, and he's going to look back and be like, oh yeah, they were sent to build. They were allowed to build. God's going to work it out. But even though at times we get discouraged and at times we get down, we have to refresh ourselves with the Word of God and then we have to get busy with the things of God and then we have to remember as we get going, serving God, it's going to require perseverance because there's going to be that next wave of discouragement that's going to threaten us to take us down, that's going to threaten to push us back. Um, I'll just read this one tonight. You can write this down if you want to. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Remember, friend, God was watching his people whether they would persevere. Listen to this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from thenceforth thou shalt have wars. He's referring back to David. But the understanding is still the same. God is running to and fro, looking at his people, seeing the ones who, yes, they're discouraged. Yes, they've kind of hit a wall. Yes, they are struggling. Yes, it just feels like it's not what it used to be. But God's looking for those children who refresh themselves with his word. And then that refreshment leads them to get busy again. They get past that hurdle. And then God's looking to see, hey, there's going to be some wickedness in this world that's going to come at you again. Will you stay faithful? Will you trust his word? Will you follow him? God will never ask you to do more than you are able. There's a man in, um, I think, uh, St. Louis uh, in, in the 90s. His will included a staggering number of people he wanted to help. Um, his plan included $2 billion for the city of East St. Louis, another billion and a half for the state of Illinois, two and a half billion for the national forest system, and to top off the list, this man left six trillion dollars to the government to help pay off the national debt. Sounds like a good guy. 
The problem was all he had when he died was a 1983 Oldsmobile. He made grand promises, but he couldn't keep them. We serve a God who is watching us and keeping an eye on us. And even when we get discouraged, he's seeing how we're going to take that discouragement. And are we going to go back to his word or are we going to use other things to fill that void? And are we going to get his word, refresh ourselves? Because that is a promise. God's word will refresh us. We're going to get back busy and we're going to be stronger. and We're going to be ready for that next set of discouragement because that is going to come. Discouragement's going to come until we're out of here, until we're in heaven. That day, you don't got to worry about discouragement anymore. But until that day, you will. Uh, read one more verse. These are all good. Look at verse 11. And thus they returned us answer, saying, We are the servants of God, heaven and earth, and build the house that was builded these many years ago, which is a great king of Israel, build it and set up. So what are they doing here in this letter? So they send this letter back. Israel has written this letter for them to send back. And who are they giving glory to? Their God. Lastly, just, just a thought as we leave tonight. Refresh by reflecting on God. So not only do we refresh ourselves by God's Word, we refresh ourselves by getting back to work, we remember there's going to need to be perseverance because that next discouragement's coming, and then we're refreshing ourselves by thinking on God, His promises, His goodness, His wonder, His splendor. We'll be talking a little bit about that this coming Sunday from the book of Isaiah. But friend, <coughs> have you been discouraged? Maybe you are tonight. There's different levels of discouragement, levels, and some of them get very dark and very deep and can lead to a depressive state. There's different levels. Wherever you're at tonight, maybe you're doing really well. Would you refresh yourself with the Word of God? I have to. Would you refresh yourself by getting back busy for Him? I need to. Would you refresh yourself by getting ready for when that next wave of discouragement comes? You have a plan and you're going to stay focused on Him. And lastly, would you right now reflect on the God who created heaven and earth? Would you reflect on the God who genuinely cares? Um, sin is dealt with. Repentance is necessary. God's work is done His way. God will help. And there's a faithfulness to the words of the Lord. The work's going to get going. But guess what? From chapter 4 all the way to the end of Nehemiah, there's going to be, they're going to be bombarded with problems and struggles and heartaches. But there's one constant. And that is God is with them through it all. Do you believe that tonight? Because you're going to get discouraged. You're going to go through that time. But God is the constant through it all. Man, you and I got to remember that. A lot of things are going to come up. God is the constant in it all. Heavenly Father, God, we do love you, Lord. Thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, we're going to see next week that the king uh, allows them of course, God, you are leading in all of this. But God, the king will allow them to continue the work. And yet there's going to be a, another problem, another issue that will arise. And there'll be some strife among people, God. And yet, Lord, through it all, if we just get back to you, get back to refreshing ourselves with your word. Lord, if there's someone here tonight who's discouraged, Lord, would they not lay their head on their pillow tonight until they studied your word and found an answer for what they're dealing with? God, would they get back busy for you? God, would they find a way to serve you in a, in, a, in a mighty way that would bring glory and honor to you? Would we all remember that even though the devil's out there, he's seeking as a roaring lion, God, you're walking to and fro as well. And you're looking for those faithful people who are just faithfully, diligently serving you, even in times of discouragement. God, I pray as a church you'd help us to all remember this in Jesus' name. Amen.